Hello, everyone. It's been a while. <laughs> I am just hoping that my sound is on okay. I'm just going to check here. Yes, it looks like it's working. So hello, everyone. I see that there's lots of conversation going on in the chat already. So glad you're here from all over the place. And I believe that I have two new Karen's cult m members here for the first time. So Catherine Depew and James Throgmorton, welcome. And <laughs> I apologize, but I'm doing this all on my own. Uh, so <laughs> it's been a, a little while since I've done it, so I may be a little bit clumsy on a couple of things. So please just bear with me. I hope everybody's had a wonderful summer for us here in Ontario. Labor Day is the day when everybody goes back to school and everybody comes home from their summer holidays and it's like a new beginning for the year. Now, I don't have any children, so I don't have that feeling quite the same way, but you can definitely feel a difference in the air. It is definitely coming, winter is coming. <laughs> we can feel that. So uh, lots of people from all over. I've got Barbara from Hamilton and I've got my Nancy from California. So great to see you here and Mama Koala. So glad you showed up. We have lots of questions. I guess some of you have been storing them up. So I am just going to take a moment and pull up those screens. I just have to make this one a little bit smaller so I can see them. And oh, yes. Um, let me just pull these over here. I had posed the questions. Uh, if anybody had any questions to put them in Facebook and in my, um, in, uh, I, we had it on Instagram and we had it on YouTube. So I'm just going to answer those, start with those questions first. So Sam Smith has asked if I have any tricks or tips on how to work with half square rectangle blocks. Now, by the lack of tips and tricks, you can understand that rectangle blocks are just a little bit more tricky to work with. Uh, they don't give you, if you cut them in half uh, and sew along the divider, you don't get that same beautiful half square triangle uh, that you do with half, half square triangles. Uh, with rectangles, Half square rectangles, you have to work them two at a time. That's really the way that you've got to, the only trick really that I know for them is that you work them two at a time. And what you need to remember, do I have my, my little sign here, where did I put it? Of course, I took my board the, away the other day. So the problem with um, half square rectangles is that, you know, you've got that corner point that you want to line up. And it's not the same for, you don't have the same seam allowance and you've got to shift them over. So let's say this is your half square rectangle. The sew line is actually in from it. And it's not so much that you are matching the, the corners or the seam allowance is it's this point right here, that point right there. And you've got to measure in a quarter inch and a quarter inch or develop a template just so that you can easily mark those because those are the two things that you'll match up. So when you take your two of them and you put them together, they're going to be like this and they're just going to be slightly cockeyed. It's just the way it is. <laughs> unfortunately. But that's my best tip is just know where that corner seam is going to be. You're going to end up with a really long tail here. Like it's going to be over a half centimeter. God, sorry, got to think imperial here. It's going to be over a quarter of an inch longer. Sometimes it's even half an inch. And sometimes on really narrower ones, it can get almost to an inch longer. Um, and then you think, oh, that's a lot of wastage too. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why often there's templates with those engineered corners that cut that off. But um, that's my tip. Work two at a time and just know where that uh, seam point is supposed to be. Nad has asked, uh, hoping for tips to sew sashing straight. She, uh, even though he's lining them up and has a quarter inch, how do you sew sashing straight? 
Well, if it's square and if you've got your quarter inch seam, you might be, there's a couple of different things. You might be folding it in half ahead of time. I've got a piece of sashing right here, oh, a long piece here, like at the end. So if you fold it in half and you make a really hard press on it, when you fold it over, you're always sort of battling with um, the layers because the under layer, um, even though it's the same width as the top layer, it actually has to travel less. So I never press that. I always leave it straight. So when I'm sewing my quarter inch, I can just play with that. And there's a little bit of wiggle room and it's not so sturdy and you're not working against it all the time. Um, the other thing is be sure you're using a walking foot because sometimes your, your measurement goes off because you're just managing all those moving layers and a walking foot will help you manage those. And I don't know how far along you are in your quilting journey, but a quilt that has a slightly wonky uh, sashing on it will still, I should, oh, sorry, you're asking about sashing. I'm answering about binding, but if, even if you have a wonky batting, um, it will still be warm and comfortable. Now, you can see I'm out of practice here. I've, I've read sashing and I thought binding. Uh, for sashing, I've done a video on how to keep your sashing nice and straight. Um, not quite sure if I can pull up a photo of it right now. Let me just see if I can find what it looks like. It's the one on uh, my block assembly number two. It was how I put together my city sampler um, quilt. Let me just see if I can find that thumbnail so you know what it looks like. Uh, I have made over 300 videos and it's like looking for a needle in a haystack now. <laughs> I, I get an idea. I very vaguely remember when I made it. Uh, here it is right here. Let me just throw it up on screen. If you see it, it's called to sash or not to sash. <laughs> so that's what it it's, uh, looks like. And uh, just take a look for it in my library. Next question. Um, this is from Sarah uh, Armitage. My question is, how do you work around a few blocks in your scrap quilt that you trim smaller than the rest? Well, it's a scrap quilt, so a little less critical than a non-scrap quilt. Uh, first tip is you could cut them all to the same size. If you cut one a little bit smaller, just cut them all to the same size. Uh, you could add some scrappy sashing to that block if it's that much that you trimmed off. Or you could take all the trim blocks and sew them together in a block and then put sashing around that block. You can forget about using them on the front. Just make a couple more and put them on the back. Or you can save them and have them start a whole new project. So five different ways. Beth Douglas has asked, what am I doing with all that felt? I had a delightful time at the felt store and it is material that I'm using for my next fast and easy gift video, which I hope will come out in October or November at the latest. Yeah. Uh, let me just see what's going on here. Oh boy, we've got lots of people here tonight. Thank you very much for showing up. Lynette Root has asked, do I quilt on my long arm for others? And how's my free motion coming along? Um, I let my friends use my machine. I will often quilt the charity quilt for my guild. Um, I have asked some of my friends to give me their quilts so I have more quilts to practice on. But I do not quilt for other people at this moment. I just don't have the time. It, and I, I honestly don't think my skill is there except for pantographs and basic quilts. But um, my free motion quilting skills are getting better. 
I made lots of scrap quilts this year and I keep practicing. I am listening to wiser people than me on free motion quilting. So that's Angela Walters, Tracy Russell of Whirls and Swirls. Um, I was watching some Natalie Bonner. Um, I've, I've got graffiti, um, graffiti quilting. Who is that? That's Katie Porter, I think is her name. Sorry, I'm getting that wrong. I apologize to her, but uh, just following that. So it's been fun. It's been fun because I'm all, I'm actually ending up making my own shapes from what they're showing you can do. There's a swirl, there's a, there's a paisley, there's a straight line and how you can combine them all together to find the shape that you like doing. And it's so much more important that you quilt it evenly than you getting the, the design absolutely perfect. They say that all the time and it's absolutely true. So it's just learning how to do the free motion design, this side to the right, to the left, upside down and all that and being able to fill in those corners. And I'm not horrified with my effort. <laughs> There's some days where I think, yeah, I got it. And then the next day I'm going, oh no, <laughs> we're not showing this one to anyone. <laughs> so, but I have yet to rip out any work. So I guess that's really the big test. I, I keep it all. Yeah. Brenda has asked, do you use cotton to piece and poly to quilt? She hears so much uh, different options about this. So what the biggest characteristic that cotton has going for it is it's soft. And the biggest characteristic that poly has going for it is it's strong. So if you are using a tiny thread, a light thread, and funny enough, that means the number goes up. So if you're looking at a 40 or, not, sorry, if you're looking at a 60 or an 80 or a, a 100, you're wanting to use a poly because poly is so much stronger at that smaller uh, size. And as you go thicker, so like a 40, a 30 or a 12, um, you are wanting to use cotton because they're softer at that size. The, the, poly, the poly just can't be soft at those sizes. So with quilting, most of the time we're sitting in the middle, that sweet spot of 40, and 50 uh, and you can go either way one or the other um, for many years I wasn't even strict on just using all cotton or all polyester or sometimes I would use poly in the bit bottom and sometimes cotton in the top um, so I've mixed it up a lot and none of my quilts are worse for wear for them so I, I think there's really no hard set rules of which ones you have to use. But again, if you're, you're wanting a thicker thread, you're thinking cotton. If you're thinking a narrower thread, a uh, more delicate thread, uh, you're, you're wanting to use a poly. Yeah. Uh, Carmen has asked, uh, she wants to know if I machine base my border edges before I start to quilt the top. Um, Sometimes I always, on my long arm, I definitely base the top. And I used to do that when I was uh, free motion quilting on the domestic machine too, because your top likes to travel. It just does. Um, I will base the sides if I'm doing a pantograph. And that's mainly because I cannot see the work. If I'm up close, I can see and I can manage um, the sides. But, uh, you have the question that you seem to have these bubbles and waves and extra materials. And in all my videos, I'm always constantly saying your quilt has to lie flat. And when it doesn't lie flat, that's when those waves and those puckers come. So sometimes you can, there are ways that you can forgive yourself for doing those things, but you just need to be more attentive of it. You need to be able to, to um, I'm not going to say manhandle it. On a long arm, we use things like I've got a couple of rolls of pennies and people talk about using soup cans and that just helps pull the top slightly from one side to the other. And you can definitely do that on your domestic sewing machine. You, um, if I have too, like if I have too much top, sometimes I'm just pushing 
a little bit extra in with every single thread. My hands are just, I'm just pushing it a little bit harder through. Um, and you, it's often good to do some big overall stitching just so that you can quarter off where that bulk is and it's not all saved for just two square inches or it gets tucked away. A big common problem is that people have wavy borders. That is a huge problem that a lot of beginner quilters have before they figure out how to tackle it. And the easiest way, I'm just gonna take this napkin here, so let's just say it was a wave. You just pull it over, make a tuck, and then sew straight along the top and just absorb all that extra stuff in. Um, I've got a couple of quilts where I did that too. Uh, and nobody knows, nobody knows. You just tuck it right in and uh, take up all that space. So there, there have been quilts that I have, I have, I have chosen a very um, complicated pattern on the top and I found that I wanted to baste it ahead of time just to be sure, like do some strips across the top just to make sure that everything stayed in place. And there's been some quilt tops with some very square blocks on my long arm that I've, I've pinned it as well so that things don't move around. So unfortunately, quilting is not, it's not an easy home stretch. You still have to be aware of a lot of moving pieces. Um, any tricks to, uh, this is Beth Douglas asking, any tricks to managing all those seams, those quilting seams on a flimsy when you also have pieced the back? Again, I constantly talk about the back has to lie flat. The back being flat is more important than the front being flat. So you don't want to have complicated stitching on the back or places where you've got, um, four pinwheels coming into intersections and things like that. You just want simple sewing on the back of uh, your pieces. But remember, you also have a big piece of bind, like you've got a bind uh, batting that goes in between your two layers. And that has a, a remarkable ability to uh, absorb some of that back. So if I have a really big intersection on the back, I'm or even just the straight seam going down the back. I will note where that is on the front so I know to take extra care as I'm moving over it. Um, and I don't try to do fancy custom stitching too much on the front when I've got a really pieced back as well. I usually um, just work with pantographs or straight stitch stitching and things like that. <laughs> Dory has asked me, uh, how is my quilt coat coming along? Well, it's been a really hot summer, so it hasn't been doing very much, but um, I don't think I'm going to really address it until after I come back from Hawaii. I've got way too many things on the go, w way too many other projects that I'm working on, but I definitely have the, the way of it now, and it just needs time, which I haven't had, so... Diane, she would like to, some tips on quilting with a domestic sewing machine. So let me just grab these and I'm gonna throw them in the chat. Let me just see whether I can grab this. Hopefully this can go in the chat. Nope. Let's just see whether this will. There we go. So copy or share here. Sorry, I'm just I'm just trying to get the uh, the YouTube connection for it. So there's the video on ten fast and easy um, ten fast and easy quilt free motion quilting. Let me just see. Is that the, I think that's this one. Let me just check here. That yep. So the video looks like this. So there's ten fast and easy beginner quilting designs. Uh, they're very simple and surprisingly enough, stitching in the ditch is not one of them. <laughs> I think uh, there's many quilters who have thought that that's going to be the easiest way to begin. And it's not in it. And straight stitching is not even the easiest one. The easiest one is just to take some nice meandering lines and then just echoing on either side. 
So let me see if I found find the connection to that one as well. Uh, sorry, I'm by myself. Let's see whether that works in here. Does that work? Maybe it does. Okay, so I put those two links to those two videos in the chat. If you want to check them out, I'll later put them in the notes if they don't, if the chat notes are not saved. Um, let's go over here. So the second one is uh, t uh, ten quilt, no, eight quilting mistakes, uh, and how to prevent them. So just various little pointers that will help <laughs> getting through to the end. Okay. So let me just pause for a second and I do want to see who's here. Uh, Reg's channel, do I need a quilting sewing machine? Uh, no, you do not need a quilting sewing machine. If the machine that you're using right now, Reg, is good enough. Um, what a quilting sewing machine does is it normally gives you extra harp. Um, so you have more space to work underneath. It gives you it gives you attachments and everything that makes it better for quilting, um, and gives you some ability uh, the ability to drop your feed dogs and do free motion quilting and things like that. So it depends on your own machine, and quilting of course has that quarter inch seam. So some other machines are just not set up to do that well. The 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 feed dogs can be too wide and they don't give you enough grip as the fabric goes through. So um, if you have the ability to buy a quilting version of what you of your sewing machine when you're choosing, like you're buying one, definitely go with the quilting version. Uh, Donna White has asked, how did you construct the, my design wall? Well, funny enough, I did a whole video on that one too. Let me see, is that it? Yes, this is what the video looks like. Let me see if I can copy this video into the, the notes. Copy. There. So hopefully that made it there. Um, let me just try again. I'm not sure if that made it. Um, anyways, I made mine out of, sorry. I made mine from an insulation um, foam board and I've attached it to my wall with command strips and I covered it with a flannel sheet. But there's easier ways. I know there's someone that wrote in saying that they have very little space. Um, just use a flannel back tablecloth and stick it on the wall with masking tape and bring it down. I did that for years. Um, and it's not a cheat to use your bed <laughs> because often that is the biggest flat surface in your room, in your uh, space. So there's a couple of other ones there that I also have used. So um, check out that video. What other questions do we have here? Sue Lambert has asked, do you start in the middle of your quilt? It depends on the design. I do definitely start in the middle of the quilt um, from the edge, but from the, from the middle of the quilt and I'll work outward on both sides. Um, but the, the other part of the design, if it was, I don't do it radiating out, except in a couple of particular instances where I was, um, it was like a medallion quilt and the design went outwards. Oh, we've got some people here from the Hawaiian cruise. We cannot wait for the cruise as well. We were just, uh, just before this call, we were organizing our rental cars when we get to the different ports. And I've been contacting the various textile stores on Hawaii, um, uh, I, I'm pretty sure we will be going to Maui, but not the, the part that um, that had the fire. Um, I'm going to be sending out a notice to everybody that it will be on the cruise that we can take quilts 
that we've made and want to donate to their project and leave them with the 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 Maui quilt store. Or, um, they have a couple of different ideas. I think they were looking for colors from their local high school, but I'm sure they'll accept any of the quilts. So I'll just send that out later this week. Anyway, speaking of home quilting machine. Speaking of home quilting machines, this is Allie. Has there been a major improvement in free motion in the last 20 years that I've been away? I would say that there is. Um, one of the biggest problems that sewing machines have when you're free motion quilting is the needle comes down and then, sorry, I apologize. I've been talking away and I've left my, <laughs> I've left the board up there. Um, there has been a number of, um, it's, the, it's, it's in the timing. So the needle comes down and the bobbin takes it around. And originally that was made just to work when you're going in one direction with your fabric. However, uh, in free motion quilting, as you know, we go not only front and back, we also go from side and we go around. And they've just worked on the timing of that and the flow of that so that it works better. And you can actually do it on a domestic machine and on bigger machines, because that is one of the biggest challenges is being able to get the same tension going forward and going back. And on my machine, I have a stitch regulator. So I don't even have to worry about moving my hands at a steady, um, a steady pace. I can go fast, I can go slow, and the stitch regulator will decide how big those stitches need to be. Okay. Um, Gloria has asked, when is my next episode or my next uh, part two of Quilt As You Go coming? And it's coming this Friday, this weekend. Um, so we're do I'm doing another method. I've made some more quilts and uh, yeah, so this week. Uh, Carmen has asked, do you have a hard time figuring out what quilting designs you want to use within your borders? Um, sometimes it comes to you right away, but sometimes you do that thing they call let the, qu let the quilt speak to you. And that's just basically figuring out what's the best design in your head balanced with what skills you have. So um, I'm not particularly fond of borders. I don't put a lot of them on my quilts and sometimes I just kind of eat, like if I'm doing a pantograph then you totally ignore borders as being separate. So no, I, I usually do something different if, I, if I'm inclined. Um, I've got a couple of quilts with borders coming up and I've already got the idea in my head but basically I am just following the design within the fabric. So um, that's a possibility as well. Uh, now, I think we had a couple of people on Instagram ask a couple of questions. And I just need to find them. Um, well, watching one of your videos, this is O Yarny. You were commenting about burying your threads when you quilt. She does not bury her threads. I do uh, my top quilting on a domestic sewing machine and just backstitch. Should I be burying my threads or is backstitch good enough? Um, I would be lying if I said I'd never done that. <laughs> and I always bury my threads because that's just not true. It just comes down to where you like your fussy. Um, some people can handle fussy in different parts and just cannot deal with them in another. And if you're happy with the results that just doing a backstitch does, go for it. Once I started long arming, when I do my quilting, whether it's on a home machine or on my long arm, I always bring up the bottom thread through the top. That's one change that I've always done. Um, so I don't have knots on the back. I don't have... Um, 
I just choose where that thread comes up to the other side. And I do try to bury all my threads now, but there were, there are definitely times in the past where I have done just a back stitch and I hope, I hope. Sometimes they, it's how not knotted they can get up uh, as to how long they will stay, right? Um, so it's, maybe your quilt isn't even designed to last forever. Maybe it's a children's quilt and it's only going to last 15 years at the most. So uh, you just choose when you want to do your fussy. Yeah. Lottie, Lottie Burso has asked, do, do I have a video on how you hand stitch your binding? And I have a couple of other people that have been asking me about um, invisible stitching. So I actually brought a quilt. Let me just see if I can get this to work here. I'm gonna, just like me to try something bold when I haven't been doing this for a little while. So I'm just gonna grab my quilt here. I've got my thread, I've got my needle. Let me just see if I can get this other camera to work. Okay, here we go. You see this? Let's get these off so distracted. So, invisible stitching. So this is your binding. Here's, oh, I've lost my needle. How, how is that? Oh, no, I've got it. There we go. So I always start with burying my needle in the seam allowance. And then you come up through your binding. Of course, I've made my thread nice and long here. Invisible stitching is just going, you're doing the traveling underneath the binding stitch. So you go from there and you just come up. There. So you just, so you're just coming up just a touch. Now, how invisible it is, is how many threads you grab and how close to that edge of your binding strip. Okay, so if you wanted it more invisible than that, you'd come up just a little bit farther back in the fold here. I'm not sure if you can see that. So instead of coming in the front of the fold, I'm coming to the back of the fold. And you see how that's even less visible. Let me just pull that back. So you can hardly even see that one. So it's not onerous. And quite frankly, I don't mind them showing a touch because this is the back of the quilt. And this is where people, when they cuddle up with a quilt, this is one of the parts that they see. And I actually like people seeing hand stitches, that somebody actually took the time to be quiet with the work and add in that extra TLC to get the, to make the quilt for them. So that's how you do that invisible stitch. And you'll get better as you work with it. Um, if you're really wanting an invisible stitch, like if you were working on some applique or something where you really wanted it to be hidden, that's where you're going to use that 80 hundred weight thread, like Invisifil. And you're going to use a very fine needle and you'll probably use a 10, a 10 or an 11. They've got really small eyes. Tulip has a size 10 with a large eye. Um, and that not only is that your thread narrow, but the holes that you're making are narrow. But another thing that happens with um, quilts is that you have what it looks like when you've just done it. But as the quilt is worn, 
things begin to shift and blend and be absorbed a little bit more. So it could be really stark um, when you first sew it, but with time, those stitches will sink into the uh, fabric on the back. Um, this was also a flannel back. I find it's easier for the stitches to disappear within flannel because it just has that little extra loft. And <laughs> I love hand stitching mine. If I have the time, I definitely hand stitch. So who do we have here? Boy, we still have people arriving. We have people from Oregon, people, yep, more from Nor Yes, I agree. Hand binding gets easier as you do it. <laughs> Mary Angelus has asked, is the Hawaiian cruise still on? Yes, it's still on. Um, this past month, Norwegian has not been stopping in Maui and they've given those uh, cruises an extra day in Hawaii and an extra day in Kauai, which is not a bad thing either. Uh, so I'm... I'm not good at, things are not back to normal in Maui, but businesses, many businesses are back opening and I would suspect by the end of October, we will be stopping in Maui again. I was in contact with a number of the quilt stores today and they're all still working hard through the trauma, but um, I'm hoping things will get better for them soon. Yes, uh, some people say that they're not a fan of hand sewing and um, I would recommend that you definitely use a thimble if you hand sew, otherwise you're, <laughs> they have a tendency to get really sensitive. I, when I first started, I thought I don't need a thimble. I use a thimble every single time now and I've got several, I've got one in every place that I sew, but I don't, I don't have a ten, I prefer not to, um, hand sew my baby quilts just because one that's easy to manipulate through the sewing machine um, and just speed. So those ones are all, most, most of the time those are machine sewn. Okay, let me see if I can find some more questions here. Victoria's asked, have you ever found a serger useful in quilting? I just inherited one, but I don't do garments. I have made entire quilts with a serger. <laughs> Uh, one of my one of my first quilts that I made. Um, unfortunately, a friend of my husband's passed, and I offered his widow that I would make um, a quilt for her out of his shirts. And the shirt, and of course, I'm thinking that they're going to be cotton and wovens and everything. I did not know her at all. Um, and what came to me were all sorts of knitted jerseys and t-shirts and rugby shirts and things like that. So I was flummoxed with what I was going to do. I, um, and I just got out my serger and it was actually really easy to do. And with all these knits that were well used and soft, uh, it turned into a beautiful quilt with a really nice heavy weight to it. I really loved it. So um, it's, one of the one of the videos I have yet to make. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Somebody says uh, Angela Walters is fabulous. She is. She's just a wonderful person in in public. She is so generous with all that she knows. Um, she just. She's just a really good human being. <laughs> I don't know. She was, uh, her show was really popular when I first started out and she was really inspiring. Um, I was lucky enough to see her speak in person and she is very genuine and lovely. And uh, yeah, I still enjoy watching her. A lot of people here are talking about Karen McTavish. Now, Karen McTavish, she was really big just before I started quilting. She had a whole, she has a whole technique named after her. It's called McTavishing. And uh, she, she's still a great teacher. People still talk about her. Carly Porter is the graffiti quilting, quilting gal. Thank you, Amy, for saying that. Now I see it, it's obvious that's what her name was. She is an excellent graffiti quilter. She has done some amazing quilts. And if you like free motion quilting, 
uh, Katie Lee Porter is somebody you should look at, into. How to, oh, how, Georgina Yardley, how to quilt a king size quilt on a domestic. Well, you're going to want to turn into um, my next video, the next method of quilt as you go, because that is a technique that will help you quilt the king size quilt on a domestic sewing machine. It has to be how you put it together. Uh, I mentioned soup cans and people are wondering what it is about soup cans. So if you can imagine there's, here's the head, the throat plate where you are sewing and your quilt is lying straight across on a long arm. And if you put a soup can on it, it presses it down. So what it's helping doing is helping absorb extra top. It, it's just a way of it move and you can shift the soup cans around depending on where you need to absorb it. Uh, there are people that have, there are long armors that have done things, nothing short of miraculous, been giving quilt tops that you thought there's no way in the world they're going to be able to make that plot. And they have done, they've used that technique and helped them shift the, the top so that they can absorb it all in. Now there's other things that they do too. So sometimes you spritz them with water to help shrink it in. Um, what are some of the other things? Again, I'm talking about that quartering. So you spread out the, spread out the, the excess, but it's amazing what some talented long armors can do. Um, is there space in the, uh, Hawaiian quilts, uh, the quilting crews, the thing to Hawaii? Yes, there is still a couple of spaces left. We're, we're almost full. Um, I think we're down to the last couple of spaces, but uh, yeah, it's going to be a big group. Um, somebody has asked, where is the next one? Well, uh, we've just done the final brochure on Iceland. Uh, next year, we're, it's in June. Uh, we are leaving from Southampton and we stop in Ireland. We have three days in Iceland and then we come back via Scotland. Uh, we have a Bernina uh, rep coming on board. We have some Bernina machines. Uh, Katie and her husband own a shop in Southampton and they are techs and they're going to come along as well. So I'm really excited. Uh, going to have lots of fun. I'm going to see volcanoes from Hawaii and Iceland in the same 20, uh, 12 months. I'm more than excited. <laughs> Oh, we've got a lot of Australians here. Thank you for showing up. What time is it in Australia? It would be seven or eight in the morning. Well done, you guys. Diane from Sudbury, north of us. Have you got any snow up there yet? I think it's too early for snow in Sudbury. Sudbury. Yes. So, Lenora is a new to quilting and she finds the cutting mat and the ruler do not come out the same. Is this normal? She likes using the ruler and the narrower lines, but not the yellow markings. What do you use? So it's one of the things that you learn. You're a beginner, so give yourself some slack um, on how to use the ruler and the cutting mat. I personally love to cut fabric. I could cut fabric all day long, seven days a week. I just love it. Um, I don't want, I, I'll never buy an AccuQuilter if I, <laughs> as long as my hands can handle it. Um, because I just, it's just part of the quilting that I just love. And I use all my cutting mat. I use all my rulers. I use all the angles and I, I don't have an excess of rulers, but I have definitely my favorites. And this is something that you're just going to dis discover as you uh, move along. What size rulers you like to use, um, how to handle the fabric. And as you've noticed, different rulers have different lines. So there's some that just have thin black lines. Those truly are my favorite. Um, and then you have ones that have bigger yellow lines. I actually received samples of some last year that had these thick blue lines on them and you could not see through the blue lines. It was, they were just useless for quilting. So, um, 
yeah, you're going to find your favorites and you're going to find your favorite way to cut. So if you've got your ruler edge and there's the line, um, your, your rotary cutter, don't have a rotary cutter here. Let's see this. So let's say this is your rotary cutter that comes right up against your ruler and it takes a little bit of skill to learn how to hold that ruler flush that blade flush against the ridge or the ledge or however you want to call that profile of your ruler um, steady against it and not wiggle away from it and wiggle back to it or be on an angle. Sometimes you push too hard into your ruler and it flanges out at the bottom or it goes this way and it gets tucked underneath the ruler. So it's just one of those skills that you'll improve with and you'll also discover whether you want to use the lines on the cutting mat or the ruler or both. There's many people that say never ever use the lines on a cutting mat. And that's just not true. There is more accuracy, they say, from the ruler and the printing. And sometimes there are, sometimes there's, uh, you buy a no-name brand of mat or a no-name brand of ruler and they can be off. But that's the exception and not the rule. I find I will put my rulers down on top of my cutting mat, all over the cutting mat and Every so often I find a millimeter different, but not much. And most of the time, like when you're making big blocks, like six, six inch blocks and things like that, um, we're not usually measuring to the micron. So if you're a beginner and you're doing nice big blocks and simple blocks and things like that, those small little minor differences are not gonna help. One of the problems that we have also is that our fabric moves. Uh, underneath the ruler and that can be a couple of different things I've done a couple of videos on cutting mistakes and how to look out for them but sometimes that's a wiggly table that you have so sometimes you want to put some weights on your fabric so it's not shifting around on you so um, I've got I've got a whole playlist on tips and tricks on how to cut better so definitely check that out Oh, we're losing some of our English people. <laughs> They're going to bed. <laughs> Thank you for showing up. Oh, who's here? So I, I just wanted to mention, I'm sorry that I've been away for a little while, but um, I just after I, I came back from QuiltCon, I hired a, a young woman to help me kindle and I've interviewed her on Karen's Quilt Circle and we were going swimmingly along and then unfortunately she got sick. Um, and we've tried to work together, but unfortunately she needed more time to, to get better and focus on herself. So that arrived in the summer and it also arrived at the time that I was getting my jaw diagnosed. Um, so there's been a little bit of upheaval in my life and we just needed the summer to sort that out. So this is one reason why I'm doing everything on my own right at the moment. So uh, I just put out a one ad today for a new assistant. So hopefully I will have some help soon. Uh, Dom Berkshire has said, can't you use a ladder stitch for binding the quilt? It's also invisible, just like closing up a pillow. Yeah, you can. You can use whatever stitch you want to. Um, many people use fancy stitches and I've been to quilt shows when I've seen just beautiful decorative stitches along the binding, keeping it closed. So do whatever, whatever you like to do. Uh, here we are. Oh, I answered that question before. I keep getting to the same part. How is Mando? Mando is very well. He has also suffered a little bit this summer. He has allergies. <laughs> he has, uh, he's had some environmental allergy, so he feels it in his paws. So reactin is part of his daily routine now. And uh, the person that used to, I used to send him to doggy daycare, but 
that gentleman has moved away. So between my son and myself, we've been doing a lot of dog walking. And there's many days where I have to spend the time walking him. So three times a day. That's a lot of a lot of time walking. That's three hours out of my day. So I've now hired a dog walker uh, to help me with the lunchtime ones when she can. Uh, let me see. Where pa Um, somebody has asked, how is my new sewing setup doing? It has taken me a little while to figure out where to put my sewing machine. Um, there was a woman, I'm sorry, I forget where I found your question, who's also setting up a small sewing space and she's wondering, what do you start with first? So Finding where your sewing machine sits in your space is a little bit feng shui. It's a little bit um, practical of what where it can fit. But when it doesn't sit in a spot that makes you comfortable, it's hard to sit down and do it. And I think I finally figured out where my sewing machine goes in this room. I had to put something between me and the door and it's helped tremendously. I've also found that the motorized table, oh my God, I, I, I know that they were popular during COVID. I, I never quite got on them. I've had the hand crank ones, but this motorized one with the memory settings, I just love it. <laughs> it's just been being able to press a button and it move up to my cutting height and then move down to the quilting height and then move to my sewing height. It's just been lovely, lovely. But this space is now becoming more comfortable for, for sewing. I've, um, I've been long arming here, of course, for some time. But uh, yeah, life has been good. I've, I've made a lot of quilts this summer. Uh, not None of them was uh, extremely intricate. They were all mostly using up my scraps. And you'd think after making all these quilt tops that I would have no scraps left. And... <laughs> It's just so funny how they just, they just keep coming. The scraps just keep coming. So uh, I am actively working on my crumb quilt. So you're going to see the results of that pretty soon. Uh, John, John from Art East has asked, I hope you're feeling better. Well, uh, once my jaw was finally diagnosed, I have trigeminal neuralgia, which is not a good thing to have, but it... I have medicine that I'm taking that has taken all the pain away. Um, and it's just something I'm going to have to deal with. I'm lucky that the medicine is working extremely well with very few side effects. And uh, yeah, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. No script here is asked, do you know how many quilts I have completed? No, I've, I've never kept a running tally. And... Honestly, I don't, I, I've intentionally not done that because to me, it's not about the number. Um, I've always been a very service oriented person. So I've made a lot of simple quilts for different community um, initiatives. I continuously make baby quilts. And um, right now I'm making some campfire quilts for the fall. So we can all sit around the campfire with a, a quilt on top of us. And I'm going to take a quilt with me to Maui. But I think, honestly, before Panama, I really had only made three quilts this year. And since then, I think I've, I'm up to like 25. Uh, I haven't completed them. Let me rephrase that. I've made 25 quilt tops. So I'm just in the process of quilting them. I'm continuing to experiment. Um, I'm now doing... Uh, some with a silk binding, one with a bamboo, one with a uh, wool, and one with cotton, and one with poly. And I'm going to take them to my guild and see whether they can figure out which one is which. Uh, yeah, I, I continue to experiment with threads. Uh, I got my embroidery unit up and running. I went to Bernina and they gave me a crash course in it a whole different rhythm than quilting, a whole different process, a whole different thinking about it. 
And I finally just broke down and went and bought a complete Kimberbell project um, because I'm a person who likes to shop from their stash. So I wanted to have everything on hand so I could just pull what I needed. So luckily I found a person online that was getting rid of their uh, embroidery stuff. So I got all these threads and stabilizers and then I was at Kawartha Quilting and I bought everything. And I've had a lot of fun. <laughs> Had a lot of fun. It's going to be fun, uh, but it's very different. Like uh, there's no combining quilting at the moment with embroidery. It's a time to do embroidery and it's a time to do quilting. So hopefully I'll be able to combine them in years to come. I am uh, Susan has said, I am moving from a cool climate to a humid climate in Northern Australia. Can you offer suggestions on the best practice to ensure that I'm that a mole or maybe a moth doesn't occur during storage, please. Well, um, don't store it with any starch on it. Starch has a sugar in it that it has a, an attraction for some insects. Um, store it if you've got some of the, um, the desiccant that comes in electronics and things like that. Those little packages, I save them and I would put those in the bag that you save it with. Uh, the I don't know how long it's going to be in storage, but there is a recommendation that when a quilt is in storage, you take it out periodically. Like I think it's once every year or once every two years and refold the quilt on different lines. Um, but moths, moths, in Canada, we, we use mothballs and cedar chips and things like that to keep moths away. I don't know whether it would be the same in Australia. But those are my, that's what I know. Anybody else has any advice, please throw it in. <laughs> Deborah says she just bought a new machine on Friday. Watch my video about eight questions to ask yourself before you buy one. Uh, I hope it helped. I hope it helped and I hope you have fun on your new machine. Sorry, I'm not seeing very many more questions here. Lots of encouragement from each other, though. I love the way that you guys talk with each other. Quilts for Survivors. Yes, that is another charity that I do support. And I'm actually speaking, not this year, but next year at their um, annual get-together. So I'm looking forward to that. And I think... We've, we're probably at that mark where it's time to say goodbye. <laughs> I, can't, I can't believe it's been an hour already. It's just crazy. Um, what can I say? Uh, last week I had a video called What's on the Back, if you want to check that out. Um, and I interviewed Pamela Weeks from the New England Quilt Museum. And we talked about her uh, collection of Quilt As You Go quilts from hundred and some years ago and how quilt as you go has been a long-standing technique uh, that was really interesting she was um, I've got to figure out how to get to New England to to catch up with her I've got a couple of a couple more Karen's quilt circle interviews ready to go um, and I hope you look forward to them uh, you can now listen to them on YouTube music just download the app and you can hear it as a podcast if you're ever in the car traveling anywhere and uh, can see that so I hate to say it, but it's time to go. And I hope by this time next month, uh, I will have uh, a new person at my side <laughs> helping me get this stuff out for you. So thank you everyone for all your encouragement, not just with me, with everyone else. Take care and I will see you next time.